Hello everyone. In this video, I want to take a look at the somewhat famous IG3 data points guidance document for the ESRS. I want to look a little bit about the document. What is it? What are the data points? And I want to talk a little bit about what I think the usefulness of this document is, but perhaps more importantly, what I think it should not be used for. So let's dive in and take a look at IG3. Let's start by taking a quick look at what IG3 is. And here is the guidance note or the implementation guidance for IG3. And we see here that IG3 is the list of ESRS data points. Skipping to page four, we can find out what that means. So we see here that IG3 is an Excel format file. It contains the complete list of all disclosure requirements in the sector agnostic standards. The Excel file covers all the standards except for ESRS 1. And that's pretty much all we need to know at this point, except for this little note down here. There are 161 data points which are considered mandatory, and a further 602, sorry, a further 622 data points which are subject to materiality assessment. Now, the reason I point that out will become clear in just a second before we look at the data point sheet, but this indicates that there are 783 data points in total. Let's look at the Excel file then. And here it is in all its glory. We can see there's a short cover page and then there are a number of sheets in this workbook and each sheet is one of the topical standards and there is ESRS to the general requirements at the start and ESRS2 minimum disclosure requirements is the second one. Each of these then the topical standards what they've done in this sheet is they've broken down the standard in this case E5 into these very small data points and each data point covers what is arguably the minimum separable piece of reported information which must be reported. So all of these rows here, they make up the 780 or so individual data points. And you can see here that many data points can be attached to the same disclosure requirement. The disclosure requirements from the standard are in the third column. So you can see that ESRS 5.2, that single disclosure requirement, has about eight or nine data points which belong to it. So let's take a little bit of a deeper look into a couple of things I want to say about IG3. And the first things I want to say are two use cases of this document, which I would shy away from. The first use case is the idea that this document can be used to plan your reporting effort. That if there are 783 disclosures, and you have to report around 500 of them after materiality, you can kind of track your progress towards completion of your report by moving through those 500. And, you know, if you've got half of them left to report, you've got half of your reporting effort remaining. I want to tackle that one first before we tackle the second one. Now, that argument and that approach to using this document, I strongly advise against for the simple reason being that each of these disclosure requirement data points, so each individual data points, requires vastly different amounts of effort, both to gather the information required and to draft the data point itself. Here's an example. If we go to ESRS E1, which is the climate related standard, you'll see that a number of these individual data points are single numeric metrics. For example, here, data point E1502, which refers to paragraph 37A of ESRS E15 in the standard. The value here, or the data point, is the total energy consumption from fossil sources. The effort actually to write that number in your sustainability statement is very limited. Once you know the number, it takes about two seconds to write it into your sustainability statement. However, it may take many months of data gathering and collection to calculate that value 
depending on your business model. Obviously, those of us who have done carbon calculations will be much more familiar than with these type of metrics here. The total scope three greenhouse gas emissions. It is a single data point reported inside a single table and it looks based on IG3 that it has the same kind of weight or the same kind of effort as all of the other data points. And if you were just tracking them one after the other numerically, it would hide the fact that getting scope three emissions totals can require months and months of effort once again, despite the fact that reporting the total final value is a very, very short exercise. So that's an exercise in where one of these values might take a very, very long time to calculate or gather the information, but a very short amount of time to actually draft into the report. The reverse is true of some of the other reporting requirements. So in the pollution standard, we have here row seven, a single reporting requirement to disclose whether and how internal policies address the mitigation of negative impacts related to pollution, air, water, and soil. Now, if your company already has such a policy in place, then all you need to do is provide a brief summary of that policy. And with certain AI tools, you can just extract a outline narrative in seconds, and then you can massage that narrative into your sustainability statement. So this is a disclosure requirement, which might take you only a couple of hours to generate the content for. So depending on whether you have this, this documentation in-house already in the organization, this one could be a very quick disclosure requirement, both to gather the information for and to draft it. And then we have another example here inside ESRS2. This is the list of disclosure requirements or data points which have been incorporated by reference. Now the actual work required to do this might be very easy if uh, and disclosure requirements are being reported elsewhere in the management report, then all you need to do is just write the references down to where those are. However, compiling this list of all of them could be many hours of work. Going through all of those data points where you may have incorporated by reference, collecting all of the links and then directing the reader to where they are in the correct places in your sustainability statement. So here we have three examples of disclosure requirements which could require completely different workflows and timescales in order to both gather the information and to report it. And simply using the data point sheet as some kind of roadmap for your reporting and for your information gathering will not convey any of that information to you. So that is the first kind of use case of this IG3 that I've seen people trying to adopt. And I don't think it is the best use case and I would certainly advise against it. The second use case then is a little bit more serious. And that is the idea that because the guidance claims that each of these data points are separable in some way, that we can treat each one as though it were the disclosure requirement. So what I mean by that is, if we look at ESRS2, Gov1, 22C, which is right here. Now, if you look at the last of these four, and if I treat this separately from the others, the requirement here is the disclosure of how dedicated controls and procedures are integrated with other internal functions. As you can see, this here, is completely context free. What kind of dedicated controls or procedures are being talked about here? What is this a reference to? If I just now wrote a paragraph about how dedicated controls and procedures are integrated with other functions in the organization, that information when read by the reader of the sustainability statement, being context free, would be completely meaningless. And the same applies to the two immediately above, 22C2 and 22C1. I'm going to demonstrate that viewing these in that manner could result in a sustainability statement, which is confusing for your reader. The way I want to make the point that I'm trying to make here is actually by reference to the standard itself. So let's look at it. Here we are now looking at the standard and I'm in the same disclosure requirement, Gov1 and we've got all of the, according to IG3, separable pieces of that disclosure requirement listed here. 
Now, the first thing we'll notice is that all of these bits of information are actually part of this, the role of administrative management and supervisory bodies. That gives us our first piece of context. The second piece of context for the four data points we were looking at is the header for paragraph 22 you shall disclose the following information about the roles and responsibilities of the administrative management and supervisory bodies. So that tells us it's the administrative management and supervisory bodies which we are trying to provide these data points for. Now, if we just looked at IG3, we wouldn't see that information. Secondly, if we go into paragraph C, we see that what we're actually doing in this specific case is we are providing a description of management's role in the governance processes, controls and procedures used to monitor, manage and oversee impacts, risks and opportunities. And that description should include one, two and three. So three is to be included inside C. It is one of the parts of C. It cannot be reported in isolation of reporting 22C because it is part of C. And if you were to take the IG3 paper simply as the complete list of all of the individual separable things that you have to report, you simply won't have access to that context. And you might end up providing a disclosure of how dedicated controls and procedures are integrated with other functions that has nothing to do with the description of management's role in the governance processes, controls and procedures used to monitor, manage and oversee IROs, which includes that description. So actually, it's only by reading the standard itself that we see that 1, 2, and 3 are included in this, and that these are not four independent and separable reported pieces of information. 1, 2, and 3 are all included inside 22C. So this sounds probably from my tone like I'm taking this really seriously and trying to warn off people from using IG3. That's not the case. I'm simply trying to point out that IG3 should not be the primary document you use to understand either what your reporting burden is, nor what information you should report in your sustainability statement. The only place you should look, or at least the primary place you should look to understand what it is you must report is in the standard. It is not in IG3. Now I'm going to back that statement up with some further argument. We're going to go back to the implementation guidance for IG3 and scroll to the very first content page here, which is the second page of the document. And here we see this implementation guidance is non-authoritative and accompanies the sustainability reporting standards but does not form part of them. The implementation guidance, which tells us what IG3 is, is not part of the standard. This means that if anything in the guidance appears to contradict any requirement or explanation in ESRS, the standard text takes precedence. The standard is authoritative. The guidance is non-authoritative. We then see here that EFRAG assumes no responsibility or liability for the use of the guidance. Then we see that users of the guidance are advised to exercise their own judgment when applying it. And the information contained in these documents should not be substituted for the services of an appropriately qualified professional. EFRAG is telling us here that you cannot use the guidance as your interpretation of the standard. The standard is the standard. The guidance is not the standard. One should note that the explanatory note is part of the list itself the instructions, explanations and disclaimer on the content of the workbook are included in that explanatory note. And the data points are not to be used as a starting point for materiality assessment, which is 
not really related to the content of my video, but that is also true, that this is not what you should use to understand your IROs. You don't start with the data points. What can we use IG3 for? I think one of the best uses of IG3 is to act as a checklist when you're coming close to the conclusion of your sustainability statement drafting, if you wish, to see whether you have covered the content of each of the disclosure requirements. It could be done for that purpose, especially if you actually want something that is in spreadsheet form. And that's one of, I guess, the benefits of this document in particular. It's its format rather than its content. The content here is not nearly as important as the format because you can use this as a checkbox to mark off whether you have or have not included the data points. That seems to me to be a fairly reasonable use of this document. However, even in light of that use case, I would still rather that I use the standard itself. Read through the disclosure requirement and qualitatively or quantitatively, I guess, in the case of the tables and metrics, check whether the content that I am writing about covers the disclosure requirement because it is here that we get the context. IG3 does not give us the context. The other use case for IG3 is actually also related to its format and not its content. And that is they have referenced the application requirements next to the relevant disclosure requirements. If you've read the standard, you'll know that the disclosure requirements are all listed one by one after the other. And you have to scroll to the end of each of the topic standard in order to get to the application requirements. That is, you have to flick backwards and forwards between the DRs and the ARs to make sure that you have covered all of the content. From a workflow perspective, this is just really frustrating. So now, if you don't have software which does that for you, that is, if you haven't bought a software or access to software, where the disclosure requirements and the application requirements have already been brought together for you, then the IG3 paper is really helpful for that. If I'm looking at paragraph 5C, BP1, the IG3 paper reminds me to check AR1. And if I click on that, then it will take me to AR1 in the standard. So it is helpful as a navigational tool to help me check the application requirements that are applicable for my disclosure requirement. Once again, this is about the format of the document, not the content of the document. If you want to know what the content of the standard is, then read the standard. But IG3 can be super helpful from a formatting perspective that it does these things that the narrative version of the standard does not do. It's about workflow. So that brings me, I guess, to the end of this video. There are some other things that could be said about IG3, but I just wanted to point out a couple of the use cases that I've seen people attempting that I don't think are particularly helpful. And I also want to kind of stress this point that the standard is the standard. IG3 is not the standard. And if you want to be compliant, you need to first have the standard as your authoritative primary source and not the guidance documents. So thanks for watching. I hope the video was informative and we'll see you again on the channel.